Hello, Fiveable. Uh, this is Shane Durkin coming to you live for your first semester one review for AP Statistics. Uh, really happy to be here. Sorry for the late start. We had some technical difficulties on my end. Apologize for that. Um, as always, as questions come up throughout the session, go ahead and log them into crowd or into the chat, and I'll make sure to stop and answer them. As always, you can follow us on Think Fiveable on many different platforms. So go ahead and check those out. Twitter, Instagram, YouTube. Definitely ways to stay on top of your grades, especially as the semester fastly approaches and the year is almost halfway done. So make sure you're following us for updates. Constantly doing new things. Amanda and the team, Tan, is crushing it. Uh, so make sure that you're following them to get all the latest updates to help you pass your AP exam. So here's what today is going to look like. We're going to kind of cruise through the first semester. Um, I have a document here that I'm going to kind of walk us through. It's going to highlight all the important stuff in AP Stat thus far. Um, I also have a PowerPoint. I think I'm going to ditch the PowerPoint and just go off the bullet points. It's a little bit more streamlined, and it'll be a quicker way to access all the material. Uh, so we'll jump into that. I do have some 25 multiple choice questions that we will also get to towards the end of this session. But essentially, the first semester breaks down to four units if you're looking at the course description. So the first unit is exploring one variable data. So that's looking at one piece of data. It's usually quantitative, sometimes categorical. Uh, and so we're going to explore that both by describing it as well as um, graphing it. Then we're gonna dive into exploring two variable data. Uh, we're gonna dive into that with some practice, some graphs, some explaining. And then unit three tends to be a difficult one for most students, it's collecting data. So how are we gathering that data, whether it's a survey or experiment? So we'll spend a good amount of time on that. And then usually in stats, we end the semester with probability, random variables, and probability distributions. And probability is one of those units you could spend forever doing. Uh, but we'll touch on it. It's something that is difficult. You're going to need to review it uh, for the AP exam. So make sure you're doing that as well when the time comes. But it's you're never going to feel 100% with probability because it is one of those really difficult concepts. I did want to show this just to kind of give you an idea of why stats is so important. Um, stats is the idea that if you want to know something about a population, how do we do that? Most times we take a sample, we make sure that that data that we collect from the sample is representative. We then perform some, some sort of analysis on it, keeping probability in mind. And then we use that data to then make an inference about the population. Because it's really tough to get numbers about a population. So what we do instead is we take samples, we analyze it, keeping probability in mind, and then use that to make an inference about the population. So that's kind of like the general thought for statistics. Um, I see someone just jumped in. Hello, pleasure. Ask me any questions. This works 10 times better when students are asking questions. So feel free to dive in and ask me questions as we move on. All right, so I'm gonna move over to my document over here that's gonna kind of walk us through. our year together. All right, and like I said, it really does start with exploring data in chapter one. And the first thing we learn about is that idea between categorical and quantitative. All right, and so categorical is anything that can jump into a category. Um, eye color, breed of dog, right? If I ask that question, I'm gonna get back a category, which is different from quantitative. Quantitative is when we're getting actual numbers back, okay? How do we graph categorical data? Well, we graph it a couple different ways. We graph categorical data using a bar graph, keeping in mind that when we do graph categorical data using bar graphs, they don't touch, right? That's different from a histogram. Histogram, the bars are gonna touch. Categorical bar graphs, they're not. Pie charts, same idea, categorical data. Quantitative data, we do a couple different ways. 
We do dot plots. We do stem plots, histograms. We don't really do ogives very often, time plots, and box plots. All right, keeping in mind that when you do histograms, uh, you don't want to have more than five bars. We're never really going to make histograms by hand. For the most part, we do it in our calculator. So that makes it a little bit easier for us. Um, and we want to check for shape. That's why we like histograms. Box plot is also great for showing outliers and the quartiles, which is what we'll get to in our next section. So after we graph our data, especially quantitative data, we want to measure it. So the whole point of graphing data is that we're not looking at a whole bunch of different numbers. We're actually looking at it in a way where we can stop and make sense of the data. So we use summary statistics with our calculator to get that data. So hopefully you're using the TI-84 or 83. This seems to be the most common calculator I find people using. Um, so I'll kind of walk us through that with the TI as well. But the first thing you're looking for is a measure of center. And center, we usually use mean and median. Keeping in mind that when we are using mean, we write it one of two ways, x bar or mu. Mu is when you're talking about a population. So mu is when you're talking about the population. X bar is when you're talking about a sample. That's going to be key on the AP exam. If you use the wrong symbol, they're going to mark you down. So X bar comes from a sample, mu comes from a population. We also like median. Median is the middle number when in order from least to greatest. We don't use mode too often. Um, it's just not as good as mean or median. So you want to stick with mean and median. Another data point or another statistic that we look for is spread. So spread can be something as simple as the range, which is the max minus the min. We also look at quartiles, which is why we like box plots. The inner quartile range, Q1 minus Q3, or Q3 minus Q1, Q3 minus Q1. We look at variance or standard deviation. Uh, those are different ways that we measure spread. And that's how we explore data. So let me show you some visuals to help you out with that. And talk about why we do that. So this slide here is from Tyler's stream on measuring center. So, all right, I'm sorry, graphing data, univariate data. So we wanna talk about four things. We wanna talk about shape. We wanna talk about unusual. We wanna talk about center. And we wanna talk about spread. So those are the four things we wanna talk about when graphing univariate data and when describing it. So shape, we use a couple different ways. We talk about skewed, either left or right. We talk about symmetrical. We have some other shapes, but we don't really use them too often. But just in case, we have uniform, we have bivariate, we have, or not my bivariate, I'm sorry, bimodal, and we have multimodal. So those are different ways that we can describe the shape of a univariate distribution as well. But for the most part, skewed right or left and symmetric are what we're going to use. You also want to talk about anything unusual. So anything, any gaps, any outliers, those are things that you want to mention when you're describing a distribution of univariate data. You also want to talk about the center. So that's mean or median. And then the spread as well. Something like this range is going to do just fine. Now, the last thing I'll say about, or one of the last things I'll say about this is you always want to mention context when talking about univariate data and describing it. So on the AP exam, when you talk or when you are asked to describe a distribution, you're going to want to hit those four items as well as context. So you're going to want to talk about whatever it is we're talking about. In this case, we're talking about the number of soft drinks that males and females drink. So when I'm describing this data, or in this case, comparing it, 
I want to make sure I talk about the number of soft drinks, the distribution of number of soft drinks drinking or drank by females or males. So context is going to be super important. Another big thing when talking about the normal distribution or exploring one variant data is location. And so that goes into our second chapter, which is all about the normal distribution, empirical rule and z-score. Normal distributions, I'm going to kind of switch back to the PowerPoint. I think that might be a little bit more effective. Um, and feel free to ask me questions at any point. I see we got uh, one student in here. So stop, ask me questions, uh, and we can dive into it a little bit more specific to your needs. Uh, but all normal distributions are symmetrical with a single peak. They are defined by its certain mu and standard deviation. So remember, the center is the average, it's symmetrical, and it's defined by a certain standard deviation. Feel free to check out my stream on normal distributions back in the replays. That's going to give you a more in-depth. We're just kind of going over it right now. Empirical rule is an important rule when we describe or explore univariate data. Um, it's the 68, 95, 99.7 rule that some students will also refer to it as. Uh, what it means is any normal distribution with the center of mu and a standard deviation of, and, and a standard deviation will have about 68% of the data points falling within one standard deviation of the average. So if I go out one standard deviation in both directions, I'm going to capture 68% of the data points. If I go out two standard deviations, I'm going to cover 95%. And if I go out three standard deviations, I'm covering most of the data. I'm covering 99.7% of observations. So going out three standard deviations pretty much covers everything. Now this is kind of where z-score comes into play. And here's just an image of empirical rule. So going out three standard deviations, you're really covering most of the data. The reason we talk about the empirical rule and normal distributions is because we like to standardize things. Standardized things allows us to compare across different distributions. The SAT, ACT is a great example of why we standardize. If someone scored a 30 or a 28 on the ACT and scored a 1400 on the SAT, who did better? Well, Z-score does it. So z-score is essentially how many standard deviations away from the average you are. If you're further away from the average, it means you're more unique or you're different, right? You're more uh, unlikely. So think about heights of people. So the average height right in the middle. And as we move away, you're moving more standard deviations away from the average. So you're more unique. There's less of a probability that you're 7 foot than you're 5'10". We like to do this on our calculators. So our calculators are great ways to keep um, keep our keep ourselves moving on the test to make sure you're not wasting too much time. We also can use our z-score chart. If you like that, use that. That works as well. We'll do both uh, when we cover the multiple choice practice in a little bit. Uh, so normal CDF is when we're trying to find between two values. PDF is when we're trying to find the exact. And inverse norm is when we're trying to find the number given a probability. So I have three examples there. Again, check out my stream on normal distributions if you want a more in-depth look at normal calculations. And just to go back, here are some facts about R that we should talk about. Let me pull up. Again, at any moment, feel free to ask questions. And I'll put this in the document as well. So the normal distribution, if it's a standard normal distribution, it has a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. Here's our z-score, here's the formula. Remember, Z is how many standard deviations away from the average you are. 
X represents the data point that you're looking at. So this is the data point where we want to know how many standard deviations away it is. Mu is going to be the average of your distribution and sigma is going to be the standard deviation. Any positive z-scores are going to be above the mean. So if I have a normal curve over here is going to be a bunch of positive z-scores. And down here, negative z-scores. Always, 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 always draw the curve. When they ask about a normal distribution problem, you're going to draw it for two reasons. One, if it's the free response, it's going to allow you to make sure that you're getting the credit. And two, it's going to allow you to see what you're actually trying to find. And there's something about actually doing that that helps you figure out the problem much quicker. What do I mean by that? Well, when I mean draw it out, I mean draw your normal curve, tell us what the average is, and tell us what the standard deviation is. So both are going to be super important for getting you full credit. All right, so looking at linear relationships, I'm going to pop back to the get out of this bone. Pop back to this. The normal probability plot is going to be the last thing we cover on interpreting probability or interpreting something, sorry, exploring one variable data. Um, and that is just essentially, how do we know if something is normal or not if we don't have a graph? Uh, so we make a graph and it's called the normal probability plot. We want to know, is this data normal? Here's how we do it. We can graph it or we can use a normal probability plot, which essentially looks at how many standard deviations away from the average you are you should see a cluster in the middle, which is good. That means it's got that mound shape. And as we move away from the center or zero, we have less and less data points. Kind of moving through this because it should be a review, but if not, ask me questions. Again, feel free to ask away. And then we'll get to some multiple choice questions towards the end of this. So when we explore oops, uh, bivariate data or two variable data, uh, we wanna look for two things. First, explanatory versus the response. So we wanna identify which one is gonna be our explanatory variable and which one is our response variable. Uh, this data must be quantitative and your explanatory variable is gonna be the independent variable. So depending on what you're talking about, the x-axis is always going to be the independent variable. The y is going to be the dependent variable. The way we show univariate, or I'm sorry, bivariate data is through scatter plots. Scatter plots allow us to graph bivariate data. Here's an example. Here, we have bivariate data. Each point represents a person or a object, whatever it is we're measuring and it represents two of two values or two data points of that one subject. Uh, when we describe, so just like we describe univariate data, we also describe bivariate data. When we describe bivariate data, we're looking for four things as well. We're looking for direction, form, strength, and anything unusual. Direction is just, is it positive or is it negative? Is it going up or is it going down? That's direction. Form for this class is just linear or nonlinear. Let me pull up my or I'm sorry, Jerry's. Jerry did this stream. We're looking for direction, form, strength, and anything unusual. So direction is either positive or negative. Form it's either linear or nonlinear. 
And strength, we go from strong, moderate, or weak. So here's an idea of this one. It is a positive because it's going up as height increases, so does arm span. It's linear. We can tell we could draw a straight line through it and it would seem somewhat reasonable. And it is strong. So we can clearly see a linear relationship. If it wasn't very clear, we could say moderately strong or weak. But this one seems to be strong. And then just like univariate data, we do want to talk about the uh, context, right? So what are we talking about here? And so at the end, it says strong association between height and arm span for the students in this sample. So we also want to provide context when talking about this. When we have bivariate data, we also use what's called a least squared regression line. So the least squares regression line is essentially your line of best fit between your X and your Y. So it takes your X variable and your Y variable and it tells you how linear is it and what's the line that fits it best. We use it to make predictions, right? So we're predicting someone's arm span based on their height in order to, to help us out if there's no data points there. Uh, so for example, if we knew someone was 65 inches tall, what would we predict their arm span to be? So I'd go over to 65 right here. I'd go up from there and I would say, hey, if their height was 65 using my line of best fit, I would predict their arm span to also be 65. Lines of best fit has certain parts. That's how you write the line of best fit. It is also in your calculator, which again, once we get to some practice problems, we will use. Um, so X represents the value of the explanatory. So any number down here. Y hat, it's important that you use Y hat, is a predicted value of the response variable. So it's what we predict based off of their X value and our line of best fit. The actual values are the dots. So we don't have infinite amount of actual values. We only have what is plotted there. A represents the concept or the y-intercept, as mo most of you remember from Algebra 1. And it's the predicted value. A lot of students forget that when writing responses. When I'm going through uh, my tests, especially this test, this is what kids forget the most, is predicted. So it's the predicted value when the response variable, or of the response variable, I'm sorry, when the explanatory variable is zero. Whew. So it was our, it's our predicted arm span if your height was zero. Predicted. And most of the time it doesn't make sense in context. Most of the time it makes no sense. If you were zero inches tall, you would have this arm span. That doesn't make sense, no matter what it is. And then we have our slope, which is your B. So it's the average predicted change in our response per one unit of our explanatory. So it's what we would predict our Y would change given our X changes by one. And we'll go over an example. So let's say this is our line. Predict an arm span for a student who is 61 inches tall. Well, remember, 61 inches tall is going to be our explanatory variable which means it's gonna go into the X. So I plug it in there, I get my predicted as 62.37. So here, my Y intercept is 11.74. So if someone was zero inches tall, I would predict their arm span to be 11.74 inches wide. That doesn't make sense. Again, you gotta be careful about the sense making of your y-intercept and your slope. Slope is right there. If I were to interpret the slope, I would say for every one increase in height, we would predict someone's arm span to increase by 0.83 inches. Make sure you put that predict. Extrapolation, 
here is their extrapolation. Essentially, it is is we have to be careful about using our line of best fit to make predictions. Um, anything outside our original data set is going to be really, really difficult to make predictions. So what do we mean by that is this is sprint and long jump. We have data from about 5 to 7.5. That's where we can make predictions using this line. I really couldn't predict someone's long jump if they ran a two-second sprint or a 10-second sprint. It's just too far out of our range. <laughs> Example, predicting the jump distance of a person who took 11 minutes to sprint. It's too far out of our range. We couldn't do it. That's called extrapolation. We talked about the interpretation. Take a screenshot of this. This is going to be a great way to just kind of plug in to any problem that you have. As blank increases by one unit, the blank is predicted to increase or decrease by a certain amount. Kind of roll through this so we can get to some practice. Residual is also going to be important, though, so I do want to spend a little bit of time on that. So the idea of a residual is the difference between the actual minus predicted. So what you observed minus what you predicted. So it's that difference right here. That vertical distance from your point to the line of best fit. An example, the athlete who actually took 5.7 seconds to do a sprint and jumped 131 inches was predicted to jump about 54. So the residual is negative 23. How did we do that? Well, we just subtracted actual minus predicted. So he actually jumped 131. We predicted he jumped 154. So the difference right there is our residual. If you get a positive residual, it means you underestimated. So the actual point was bigger than what you thought. A negative residual means the actual value is smaller than the predicted, so you overestimated. The dot is below the, below the line, and your, your point is too high. Residual of zero means we got exactly what we wanted. So our predicted matched our actual. All right, see another person jumped in. Feel free to ask questions, Annie, as we go through. Um, I'm kind of rushing through some of this because I do want to get to some examples. Um, and this is a little bit of a review. So let me know. As we move along, we have residual plots. So this is just a graph of the difference between your data point and the predicted data point. So actual minus predict. A couple important things about residual plot. One, a residual plot can tell us if a linear model is best for this data set. So if a linear model is best, a residual plot will tell us that. And the way it tells us that is if it looks completely scattered and random above and below our residual plot, then we know linear model is best. So if we have plots above and below, we know linear model is best. So no clear pattern. If you see a pattern, linear model is not, not what we want. Uh, we also have the standard deviation of the least squared regression line. So it tells us the approximate or typical prediction error when using the least squared regression line. Uh, here's a quick template to interpret S. You can go ahead and take a screenshot of that. That will help you interpret S. Last thing, I think the last thing on linear regression is R squared. R squared tends to trip kids up. R squared is the coefficient of determination which, think back to R, is a measure of strength, direction of a linear association. 
it's a number between negative 1 and 1. R squared is typically listed as percentile, and it describes what variation in the response variable is explained by the least squared regression line using the explanatory variable. It goes between 0 and 100. 100 equals perfect. 0 is not perfect at all. Um, all variation is explained by the line, and 0 is no fit, which no variation is explained by the line. Here's a template for interpreting R squared. Computer output is what we'll cover next. This is going to be common on the AP exam as well as your test. Uh, you're going to see a lot of information here. You don't need all of it. All you really need is this part right here. So the explanatory variable is always on the bottom left. The response variable is typically not listed. So here, our explanatory variable is customers in line, and we can kind of see that right there. The value next to the explanatory variable and the coefficient is your slope. And then above that, where it says constant, that's your y-intercept. So if we wanted to make this line, or this line right here, we know negative 3.822 is our constant, and 5.21 is our slope, because it's next to our explanatory variable. Make sure if you are creating an equation from a computer output or out put you label all of your x's and y's all right we're gonna spend a brief minute talking about the different types of data that you can collect uh i'm gonna switch back to this paper just to speed me up because i notice i'm looking at time it's going a little long There it is. All right. So a couple different ways we can produce data. One is through a census. That's where we collect contacts from every single person. Um, mu and sigma are the parameters used for population data. So if we did collect a census, we would use mu and the uh, sigma. Sample surveys, we collect data from a subset of people from a population to help us out with making inferences about the population. We use XBAR and SX as statistics that are used with sample data. The reason we want to know how to sample is sometimes sampling can go bad. Sometimes we have what's called response, or I'm sorry, voluntary response bias which is participants choose themselves, uh, usually have strong opinions to call in. So sampling is important. You don't want to sample bad, because when you do, you can get something like voluntary response bias. And that's essentially when, let's say we have a call-in vote. Um, I'm on the local talk radio, and I have some controversial topic. And I want to say, hey, I want to know your opinions. Call in to let me know. That's going to be bias based off of people electing to call in. Um, another bad way to sample is called convenient sample. And that's when you choose people that are easiest to reach. So if I stood outside a grocery store and said, do you feel Trump should be impeached? And I just stood out there and got people's response outside the, uh, outside the grocery store. Right? So it's going to be super easy for me. But there's going to be some sort of bias that is not going to be good for my data. Mr. Dirk, or Shane, you keep saying bias. What is bias? Bias is a design systematically favors certain outcomes or responses. So essentially, the way that we're collecting our data is not representative 
of the population of interest. So something that we're doing is systematically giving us the wrong answer. There are a bunch of different ways to sample well. I'm going to go back to the PowerPoint because there are some great visuals there. Jerry did an awesome job with those. First, we have what's called a simple random sample. Simple random sample helps ensure that we have a representative sample. We get a good mixture of everyone from the population. And it makes sure that every group of a certain size has an equal chance of being selected. So what does it mean that every group of a certain size? So essentially just whatever your sample size is. It could be 10, it could be 50, it could be 600. Whatever that size is, we want to make sure that every single person has an equal opportunity of being chosen. So here's how you can do it. Uh, if you want to take a simple random sample of 50 individual individuals from a population of 400, you could do throw all the names in a hat, randomly select 50. Every person has the same shot of being chosen or every group of 50 has the same chance of being chosen. We could assign a number a unique number to each person, and then using a random number generator or a random table, pick out of the hat. We could also use, well, those are the main, two main things. Cluster is another way we can sample. So it's when we divide the population into clusters or groups that are similar, and then do a simple random sample of the groups and every individual from that group is chosen. So thinking about a cluster, we assign each group a number instead of each person. And then we randomly select a group and we choose everyone or we give the sample or the survey to everyone in that group. So that's the difference. We also have what's called a stratified random sample. This allows us to group based off of a certain characteristic. We call that a strata. And then within each strata, we simple sum from every single strata that we created. So this one you can think about, hey, if I wanted to know how the school that I teach at feels about a dress code, stratified would be breaking them into different grade levels, 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th, then I would randomly pick some from each grade level. That's stratifying. Clustering, I would still break them up into grade levels, but this time I'm assigning each grade level a number, one to four, and then I'm randomly selecting maybe two numbers and surveying every person in that cluster, in that grade level. So that's the difference between strata and cluster. A lot of people like to think, um, some from all is strata, all from some is cluster. So that's a good way to remember it as well. Here's kind of some key details. We talked a little bit about this, bias, non-representative, uh, if you self-select, that's volunteer, convenience, Response bias is another way, um, which is leading questions. So if I said, you know, Trump has spent $5 million on golf this year, how do you feel Trump is doing with the economy? That might, that first part might lead you to say something. Um, intimidation, if your teacher asks you if you cheated on a test, you're gonna have, you're gonna maybe tell something different. Non-response bias is when people are being left out. Uh, so if you don't answer my phone call when I take a survey, that's non-response bias. Moving from samples to experiments, um, we have surveys. 
and we have observational studies and experiments. So survey gather data about a population via a representative sample. Observational study and experiments, we want to look at association between two variables. For example, which exercise program helps athletes grow muscle the most? Is there an association between attending fiveable streams and getting grades? Does the outdoor temperature impact drink sales? So what is the difference between experiment and observational study? Observational study is just, um, it doesn't impose a treatment. So we're just measuring something. Whereas an experiment does impose a treatment. So that's the key difference between an observational study and an experiment. A treatment is a condition imposed on the individuals in an experiment. So something that we give them. Confounding is a variable that will have an impact on the response variable while also have an impact on group placement. Um, so here's kind of how we talk about experiments. We have experimental units, which is kind of like, who are we experimenting on? We have the control group that doesn't get any treatment. You may give them a placebo, which is something that doesn't have any effect on them. Anytime you carry out a study, we want to have these four items. Comparison, so make sure you have at least two treatment groups. <clears throat> may or may not inclu include a control group. We have random assignment, which is make sure the treatments are randomly assigned. We have replication, so make sure you have enough experimental units. Doesn't mean repeat the experiment, it just makes sure you have enough experimental units. And then if you want, you can put blinding in there as well. So those are the four different key aspects to an experiment. I'm looking at time and I do wanna get into some multiple choice practice problems. So I'm actually gonna switch over to some multiple choice practice problems to help us out with our final exam prep. And again, ask questions in the chat so that we can best serve you all. So let's do this. All right. So we'll dive into our first multiple choice practice. Uh, a survey records many variables of interest to the researchers conducting the survey. Which of the following variables from a survey conducted by the U.S. Postal Service is categorical? Remember, categorical is a certain category. So if I ask you a question, you're going to tell me a category, not, a, not usually a number. That gets a little tricky when we talk about zip code, because although zip code is a number, it still is categorical data. Yes, I can. Uh, so Dara answered the question, fell asleep. Totally understandable. Uh, finals are coming up. Everyone's really working hard to study. I can link the slideshow in the um, review after. Yep, absolutely. And just to give me an idea, you, did you guys all stop at probability? Is that kind of where you guys ended the semester? I'll wait for your response there. Uh, so categorical data is something that can't be measured. Right? What's your eye color? What's your, how many cars do you have at home? Number of people, both adults and children living in a household. Nope, that's quantitative. Anytime you have a multiple choice test, I used to do SAT, ACT prep cross out the question if you know it's wrong, or I'm sorry, the answer if you know it's wrong. Go ahead and cross that out. Age of respondent. Again, age is a number. It makes sense to find the average of people's age. So age is not categorical. Total income, again, categorical. Years lived in a house, again, categorical. Or I'm sorry, quantitative. I keep saying categorical, quantitative. We're looking for categorical. 
E is going to be our best bet because E has a category. Where is your dad from? Ireland. Boom. Tells you a category. It doesn't make sense to find the average of people's country of residence. Number two. The mean age of five people in a room is 30. One of the people whose age is 50 leaves the room. The mean age of the remaining four people do what? All right. So we know that when I add up everyone's age, because to find average, you do everyone's age added up divided by the total equals the average. So I know some total divided by five is going to give me the average. To get that number, all I need to do is undo division by multiplying by five. So that gives me one, and I know five times three. Oops. Is 150. Now, if I know that the person who's 50 left, I'm going to subtract 50, left with 100. And now I want to find the age of the remaining four. So that 100 is the total of the four. So I take that 100 divided by four to get 25. All right, quick, easy way. Too low, too high, too high. We can determine it. We just did. Number three. In a class of 100 students, the grades on the statistics exam are summarized in the following frequency table. Okay, frequency ta table tells you how many fall into that category. The median grade is in which of the following intervals? Yeah. Okay. So a lot of, and I did this the same way. I did designing studies first, then did exploring data. So it looks like you did designing studies, then probability, interesting, then exploring data. Yeah, I, that's, the, the probability coming second is a little different from most but I don't think that's a bad idea. That's especially if I imagine your teacher is pretty experienced um, since they went in that order. Very interesting. Where, where are you coming from? While you're answering, I'll continue. Uh, so we know there's 100 students. New Jersey, awesome, awesome. I have a cousin who's living in New Jersey. We know the median is the 50th percentile. And that's easy to find with 100 students because it's the 100th student. So if this is 16, that's 42. I know that 16 plus 42 is more than 50. So between 70 and 81 has to be where my 50th percentile because it's the 50th person. Don't go down either. Right, You start from the bottom and go up. All right, number four. A set of data has a median that is much larger than the mean. Ooh, this is a good one. Which of the following statements is most consistent with this information? The median is larger than the mean. So that's describing data. So that's your first unit that is exploring data, right? So what happens if we have something that's symmetrical our median and mean are the same. Once we start getting skewness, this changes. And this essentially just has to do with what is affected by outliers. Is it mean or median? If we have something that's skewed, let's say, to the right, remember skewness, and that's not totally skewed to the right. Let's make it a little bit more obvious. Even that's not something like that. If you have something that's skewed, 
And remember, skew to the right. I just go with the tail. Wherever the tail is, that's the skewness of it. So this is skewed to the right. The mean is going to be larger than the median because the mean is affected by outliers. So these data points down here, those are outliers. That's going to pull the average up but it's not gonna do much to the median. So in this case, it says the median is larger than the mean. So that's kind of like the reverse. That's skewed, I'll draw it up here. That's skewed to the left. Where the median is larger than the mean. So this data is skewed the stem plot is skewed to the left. C. Let's double check. Yep. Feel free to stop me at any time. I'm just going to kind of go through these to help talk about concepts as well as possible questions that you may see. Using the standard normal distribution table, what is the area under the standard normal curve responding to Z greater than 1.2? So this question is asking two things. One, can you read this? Two, do you know how to use that random table or your calculator? We're going to do it both ways. So that says, hey, what is the area under the standard normal curve? Remember, the standard normal curve is centered at one, or sorry, centered at zero with a standard deviation of one. This is asking if my z score is larger the negative 1.22, so let's find that. Negative 1.22 is gonna be below my average. And I wanna know, hey, what's the probability that, or what's the area where Z is greater than it? So we're looking for this area here. Two ways we can do it. First, I'm gonna show you this way. So the first thing we can do is we can go to our table Remember, Z is going to be on the outside. We can find negative 1.22. I have negative 1.2 here. That's 0. That's 1. That's 2. So it looks like it's 0.1112. So 0.112112 is a Z of negative 1.22. And so what that means is that's the probability below that number. So to get everything above, I do 1 minus 0.1112. Using my calculator, 1 minus 0.112, sorry, 112, gets me about 0.88. Look at that, letter D. I, and I teach my students this using the calculator, where you hop on, you do stat, no, sorry, you go to second, vars, you go down to normal CDF, you want the lower bound, which in this case is negative 1.22, upper bound, I want everything above it, so I'm just going to put some really large number, centered at zero, standard deviation of one, there we go. So that finds the area. And if you even wanted to, oh, it doesn't do draw anymore. Well, that's what we're looking at. So I like to use, yes. So the question was, would you use normal CDF? You would. If you're really comfortable with the calculator, I would go with the calculator. But remember, you still want to draw your distribution. You still want to draw the distribution. The distribution is going to make sure, A, your teacher sees you knows you know what you're doing, and it's going to help you visualize what am I looking for, knowing that CDF gives you everything below. Well, yeah. So draw your normal distributions. On the free response, that's going to give you full credit on the free response part. Number six, use the standard normal distribution to find the area between half a standard deviation below and 1.2 above. 
Again, I'm going to strongly recommend you use your calculator. The calculator is going to be the fastest way and the most accurate way. If you're not comfortable with the calculator, I can show you with this, but calculator is going to be the quickest. All right. So, again, second vars. The two main num uh, letters that you're going to be using are buttons, vars and stats. Vars and stats. Those are going to be the two main ones that we use in this class. So vars, we're going down to normal CDF because we want area between two numbers. The lower has changed. It's now negative 0.5. The upper is not something really large. It's now 1.2. My center is at 0. My mu is at 1. 57%. So I'm going to go down here. 57 is right there. And we're good. Let's try number seven. A researcher is interested in determining if one can predict the score of a student gets on his statistics exam from the amount of time the student spends studying on the exam. In this study, the explanatory variable is what? Remember, the explanatory variable is the independent variable. So in this case, that's going to be the amount of time studied on the exam. Number of students is your sample size. Score on the exam is your response variable because we think that your time spent studying will have an effect on your score. So it will produce, it will change something in your score. The fact that this is a statistic exam, nope, the researcher, nope, that's the experimenter. Letter B, or sorry, number B. Foresters use regression line to predict the volume of timber in a tree using easily measured quantities such as diameter. Let Y be the volume of timber in cubic feet and X be the tree's diameter in feet. One set of data gives the following least squared regression line. Predict the volume of timber in a tree of a diameter of 18 inches. Remember Titans, this is your prediction line. Sorry, you're not Titans. That's your prediction line. That's why you see the Y hat and not just Y. So when writing and working with linear regression, make sure you use Y hat. So we want to know what would the predicted value be? So we're going to use that equation with a tree with an 18 inch diameter. So we, the only thing we have to be careful about is are we plugging 18 into my X or my Y hat? So let's look. Here it says X is the tree's diameter. So I'm plugging that into X. So I'm going to write this out. If this was a free response question, you would have to write this out to get full credit. After that, you can jump into your calculator and finish it off. But if it's a free response question, do not, do not, do not just jump to your calculator. So I get y hat equals 1050. That means we would predict the volume of timber in a tree with a diameter of 18 to be 1,050. Uh, number nine, a least squared regression line is fitted to a set of data. If one of the data points has a positive residual, then the point must lie near the right edge of the scatter plot. That's not necessarily true. The slope of the least squared regression line must be positive. Nope. You can have positive residuals for a negative slope. Actually, you will. The correlation between values of the response and explanatory variables must be positive. Again, that's not true. That's essentially saying the same thing as B. And D, the point must lie above the least squared regression line. That is true. If you get a positive residual, that means that your actual is larger than your predicted. So if we had something that looks like this, we have our line of best fit. A positive residual is going to be something like this point. And remember, residual is y minus y hat. So if this number is larger, 
R is going to be positive. So we know that we use Y to measure our residual. So this has a taller Y or a bigger Y, which means we're going to have a positive residual. Okay, so we're coming up on an hour. Oh, this is from chapter three. It's called the least, or it's called linear regression. Have you covered linear regression yet? Okay, so it is kind of one of those uh, chapters where it's kind of one off. It, you don't need to know other things to do linear regression. So it's not absurd that you haven't done it yet. Your teacher actually might be saving this towards the end when you do inference. So don't freak out if you're not doing this. Um, we're coming up on an hour. So I am going to end this pretty soon. However, it seems like you might have more questions um, that I haven't addressed. So I do want to give us an opportunity to maybe ask some questions that you're unsure of. Or maybe we can schedule another time to do this. I'll talk to um, Amanda at Fiveable to see if we can maybe schedule in another review session. Is there anything that you're, any like last minute questions that's that you're dying to get answered? You could also write down my email, send me an email if you have questions. Um, it is, Durkin Shane at Gmail. So if you do have any questions, you can shoot me an email. I can definitely help you out. If not, thank you so much. Um, and please, please, please give some feedback. How did you like it um, and how can we, or how can I do better? Thanks, see ya. Soon. 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 Always soon, right? Never soon enough.